Justin Zanuck speaks the truth. The question is, can us Jazz fans handle the truth? It's next on Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA Insider. Today on Locked on Jazz, Justin Zanuck meets with the media, lays out the Jazz plan of why they did not acquire talent and just moved for assets. A look at what they are, their vision of what they're trying to do and where they're heading, what their goals are, and they're making bets. What did they make the bets on? And will this year be different than last year after the trade deadline? Justin Zanuck believes so. We'll dig into that. Plus, the Jazz play the Warriors tonight. Steph Curry and the Warriors are rolling all of a sudden, 25 and 25. The winners of four in a row and six of seven. We'll dig into all that. As I mentioned, I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked on Jazz. It's your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Give you insight, expertise, geeky numbers and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. We are free and available on all podcasting apps and on YouTube. Please subscribe. If you're on YouTube, hit that bell button and subscribe so you get notified every time that we uh, go uh, drop an episode and you get then you're aware. Thank you to everybody for the thumbs up. We had 60 comments in the last uh, show with everyone kind of interacting and talking, and I think we had a bunch of likes as well. And I went through all 60 comments, so I'll, I'll touch on those. Um, as well, appreciate the, I think we had our, one of our high likes of all time. It makes a difference. So please hit the like button as well. Thank you so much. Today's show is brought to you in part by LinkedIn. I think that's what I just saw. Yeah. Today's show is brought to you in part by LinkedIn. LinkedIn jobs helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. So Justin Zanuck met with the media and let me run through what I thought were the seven big takeaways from his 23 minute session. The first, when he got asked, you know, at what point do the jazz get out of asset accumulation mode and start getting talent? And I think this is, when I went through the 60 comments, this is a little bit of the kind of the most, like, how long is this going on? Like, when do we finally acquire the player or the pieces? And Justin's comment is it's not binary. And and I'll admit, I thought, and I think I presented this multiple times, I thought this trade deadline would have both. I thought we would move Kelly Lynn and Simone Fontecchio type trades. And then I also thought we would probably acquire some talent. Um players that fit the timeline of of where the Jazz were going. That didn't happen. And Justin's point is, that just didn't happen, period. Not the Jazz, just period. That there weren't players that they thought could move the meter in their timeline. So, you know, if you look at who was moved, P.J. Washington went to Dallas. Daniel Gafford went to Dallas. Those are not players. Gordon Hayward went to Oklahoma City. Those are not players that the Jazz deemed as someone who they thought could move the meter in their timeline. Um, And his point is they kept their timeline, their core guys and their timeline intact. So that's Lowry and Colin Walker. They obviously made the decision to move from Ochai. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, Keontae. And now we find out about Taylor and we may find out about Bryce as well. But his point was it's not binary. Like, it's not one or the other. But the market this year yielded it to be one or the other because there weren't those players moved. Now, I think that's accurate. There is a point of, like, at what point can you force a market to move? And, you know, can the Jazz at some point have so many assets that they make a deal with someone who wasn't intending to make that, that they target the player they want and are able to, to make a move that someone doesn't, probably hard to do, right? I mean, it does feel as though like if Mikel Bridges was that player in in Brooklyn, Brooklyn wasn't playing along. Brooklyn just seemed to, no matter what your offer was, they weren't going to make that trade. 
Now, partially they don't have their own picks. And so someone like Brooklyn's probably not that interested in making a move that makes them a lot worse, even for a bunch of assets when they don't have their own picks. The second thing that Justin's biggest, I thought Justin's second biggest point, or maybe more immediate point, but then his biggest point is this. So this was his next most immediate point. They're not trying to force an outcome. So they were not doing this in order to go get that 10th pick. It seems as though if the Jazz end up with the 10th pick in the top 10 and get the draft pick, they get the draft pick. And if they don't, they don't. It does not seem to be from their from their words a driving force in how they're making decisions. Right now, the Jazz are 12th. Chicago is 25 and 28th and 11th. Atlanta, who has won two in a row and six of 10, is 24 and 29. And Houston keeps losing. Um, and they're at ninth at 23 and 29. So the Jazz are two games ahead of the 10th pick of the draft with Atlanta and Chicago competing for that 9-10 spot. If the Jazz get into the top 10, they keep their pick. And that's after the lottery. Not before the lottery, after the lottery. So if you're 10 and then somebody 11, 12, 13, or 14 jumps you and you slip back to 11, then Oklahoma City gets the pick. As of right now, by the way, Oklahoma City has the ninth pick, the 12th pick, the 25th, 6th pick of the draft. So they have three. Uh, like only like five teams have all the picks. In this. It's not quite that bad, but it feels like. And we now have the 27th pick from our trade. As of right now, at this, at this various moment, we have the 27th pick and like the 32nd. Okay, so that's one. They're not trying to. The biggest thing that was most obvious, and this is the question of whether we can handle the truth. And this is what I kind of, I think, tried to couch you for, prepare you for going into the deadline is that their vision is three or four years off. Who is going to be with us in three or four or five years from now? Let's see what we have so we know where our team is so we can add in the appropriate places for a sustainable winner. And so while they weren't trying to force an outcome, it's very clear that while it seems though Kelly Olenek and Simone Fontecchio were not a part of where this team is in three, four, five years from now. Therefore, because Taylor Hendricks and Bryce Sensabaugh may be a part of where they are, the Jazz did make moves with that intention, to see Taylor Hendricks and Bryce, possibly Bryce Sensabaugh, if he's healthy, play. Certainly for Taylor to play. And boy, the messaging to Taylor was awfully clear by Will Hardy uh, in his press conference this week, and I will get to that a little bit later in the show. The but so while not trying to dictate an outcome in games that matter, the vision of the front office is three, four, or five years off, and so moves were made with the intention to make better, so they can make better decisions about three, four, and five years off. Is Taylor Hendricks? What is Taylor Hendricks? Taylor Hendricks is a part of the future, but what is he? Like where does he fit? Is he just an elite defensive wing player? Is he? Can he be a shooter? Can he be developed? Where is he? Robert Covington? Is he Jaron Jackson Jr. or where is he in between? Is Bryce Sensabaugh college scoring level, G League scoring, some G League passing, something that translates, and can he defend well enough? Can his body hold up also? So those are the things that they want to see. And so the vision is three, four, five years off as much as we all, and I went through the YouTube comments, the comment, the number one most reoccurring comment from every Jazz fan was, but we were winning. This is last year we had started to fade and we weren't playing well. We made the moves, but we were winning this year. We were beating some of the best teams. So we were 26 and 26. We actually have a negative point differential, which is a little funky. Like we actually shouldn't be 26 and 26. We're the number one clutch offense team in the league. We're hitting 50% of our clutch threes this year. And our point differential is close to a minus three, which really should mean we should be winning about 35 games. It's a little strange. It means we may have won an inordinate amount of games to where we actually should. 
and that there might be a little falseness to our record is what that would tell you. The Warriors are plus 1.3 and 25 and 25. We're 26 and 27 and a minus three. There, that there seems much more sustainable than ours. <clears throat> that may have gone into the calculus a little bit, but even if it didn't go into the calculus, when we're saying we're winning, we were 26 and 26. You know, so a little bit of this also discussion of the, and I, you know, we'll get into this later in the show of, of whether this team can continue to win. But there's this discussion that Sarah Todd wrote a nice piece about, and then Andy Larson asked about in the press conference about like, well, have you zapped the players of their initiative to win? And now, it, you know, they were winning. They were 500. Let's, let's not, it, we great win against Oklahoma City and fun winning, beat Milwaukee twice. Like, yeah, there's a lot of like really good moments and the team's been super competitive and they've been playing really well recently, right? So I think what makes it complicated is that they were 19 and 12 with I think the 10th best net rating, fifth best offense, 19th best defense. Like that felt pretty good for a 20 game stretch since Colin started. But I don't know if that's really true, by the way, and we'll get into this. If that's really true, then we shouldn't fall off the map. We'll get into that and a few more goals and things that are important clear to, from Justin Zanna. He was very open and truthful. So let's listen to what he's saying and then we can decide whether we whether we like it, buy it, or, or in it. We'll discuss that. And whether the Jazz are going to fall off the map, we'll continue that next as we continue here on Locked on Jazz. This edition of Locked on Jazz is brought to you by Murdoch Chevy, located Woods Cross, also in Logan. The Chevy truck, oh, there's just nothing quite like the Chevy truck. It's Americana. It's everything you'd want. It's the Silverado is the big dog. The 2024 Silverado 1500. Now you can get up to $5,000 total value back to you, plus 2.9 APR for 72 months on the Sil Silverado. The Colorado truck is the smaller one. It's zippier, fun, uh, got a lot of power and juice to it while being uh, uh, much more malleable, shall we call it. And then there's the great lineup of crossovers and SUVs, starting with the little tracks, working the Equinox, the Blazer, and the Trailblazer, all the way up to the Tahoe and the Suburban. It's all at Murdoch Chevy, located in Woods Cross and in Logan. If you're going to stop by, feel free to email me first. We'd love to give you the Locked On VIP experience and make sure you have a super experience over at Murdoch Chevy. Today's show is also brought to you by LinkedIn. Anyone who's running a small business knows that it's hard to get everything done. We're all strapped for time, trying to get things to everywhere we can. And hiring is the one, the thing that takes the most time out of anything. And that's where LinkedIn comes in for you. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. It has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have to many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a million hats, so that's why LinkedIn is here for you to make the process easier. Post your job at free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks so much for making Locked On your first listen of the day. We have launched the first ever 24-7 national sports channel, Locked On Sports Today. It is also available now on Amazon Fire TV. So Locked On here for you 24-7. It'll have all the biggest stories of the NFL weekend, obviously, and a bunch of NBA stuff as well. So find out. Find your Locked On Sports Today channel now also on Amazon Fire TV as well as on YouTube. All right. Um, by the way, Jazz tonight against the Golden State Warriors. That game will be at 7 o'clock. It is available for you on Sirius XM. All hometown broadcasts on Sirius XM. Jazz Warriors 7 o'clock tonight. LeBron Wednesday and Warriors on Thursday. So pretty great uh, week of basketball here before we head to the Ulster break. That was a weird week to have those all those days off. Um, all right, next point from Justin. He wants to play games that matter. That's been very, very clear from them 
the whole time. They want games that matter. So they're not dictating an outcome. And it is clear we're not, as a franchise, going to try to win 20 games in a season. That we're going to rebuild this thing from the middle. That was the other comment that was most common in the YouTube comments from everyone was this, but we're just winning too much. So it's those people that are full in for tank. And that does not seem to be a place where the Jazz are going. They want to play games that matter. They want Taylor Hendricks to play 30 games here the rest of the way in games that matter. And they want Lowry Markkinen to develop in games that matter. That That's very, very clear. The other one was find out what we have for the future. And I kind of alluded to this already. But that was a reoccurring comment that was made. Was it playing Kelly Olenek and Simone Fontecchio to be able to secure the possibly 8th, ninth, or 10th or 11th seed in the place. There's really, if you kind of look at the standings and they're scrolling on the bottom of our YouTube standing, like there's a really big division right now. With three games about at eight. I, I don't think we were catching the Mavericks. So we were playing for nine, 10 or 11. And 11, not ideally. We were playing for nine or 10. And playing for nine or 10 is games that matter. But they're not games that are so important that we're willing, that the front office was willing to continue to have Kelly Olenek play in front of Taylor Hendricks because of Taylor Hendricks' role for the future. So these are really important games for Taylor Hendricks. The last two comments that Justin made, and I thought one was just super honest, is they're making bets. So the most interesting bet they've made here, they've made a bet that the first round pick at the end of next year's this year's draft will have more value than Ochai Abaji. So that's that's an interesting bet. Ochai was not trending in the greatest direction, but Ochai is a body and a personality that's going to spend 12 years in the NBA. That kid's going to be in the NBA forever. I'd be stunned if he's not. One, he's the best kid I've ever been around. And two, he's 6'5", 215. There's just a million of them. Like, that's just a body that stays in the NBA. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. The fact he's shooting 32% from three this year and 35% last year, like, that's not, like, the three-point, the lack of three-point shooting when you don't dribble and you don't rebound a great deal and you don't have another way to score is, does put his career trajectory in question. And I was not, Convinced he was going to stay in our line. I, I was convinced that there was a chance that Lucas Samanitz was going to replace him in the lineup here at some point in the near future. And, I mean, it's, you know, wait, that's crazy. Well, it's not that crazy because in his last 20 games with us, he was shooting 30% from the field and 19% from three. And at some point, you can't keep playing that 17 minutes a night. I mean, from December 28th on... Ochai had not had a double figure game and was scoring, was shooting 30% and 19% from three. Like that, like if you were about to bench Ochai and play Lucas Amonitz, which is what I thought was a possibility, then his value was about to plummet. And then, yes, the end of the first round pick is probably more valuable than Ochai. He's also, there's something funny in this league that the unknown aspect is always more valuable. Ochai did something interesting, by the way, the other night in Toronto. He played his first game, he went three for nine. 0 for 5 from 3, 2 for 3 from the free throw line. The three free throws is only the second time all year he's taken more than two free throws in a game. So that's cool. Hopefully that gets him going a little bit. Uh, There'll be no player I'm checking a box score rooting for more every single day than Ochai Abaji. And if it's not Ochai Abaji, it's going to be Kelly Linick. Kelly had 11.6 rebounds, three assists, three steals, and a block. Love it. Just great. And Simone went off in Detroit. Sweet. Rooting for him every day. All right, the final thing that I think is interesting is the comment that Justin does not think this will be like last year. Last year, they traded three starters that they moved that they clearly weren't a part of the future, and they really ripped apart the team. This year, 
you still have Colin, you still have Jordan, you still have Keontae, you still have Lowry, you still have Walker. You still have most of your best players. Ochai was playing, but not playing particularly well. Simone was terrific. Chris Dunn, who has been as important as anyone in the rebirth of this team this year, is still here. And if you look at the Jazz, including the loss the other night over the last two months, the Jazz are 19 and 11 since Colin Sexton moved into the starting lineup. Their net rating is 11th in the NBA. Okay, so they're like a little above average. And you, they can have slipped a little bit, right? We're now playing some non-NBA minutes. Taylor's not does not fit into our 240. And we'll see whether it's Bryce or Taylor, but right now they don't fit into our 240. So we're suddenly playing 210 NBA minutes rather than 240 of a solidified established rotation players. Though, frankly, we weren't, I don't, we weren't playing, Ochai's not there yet. So we were playing 225 or 235. No, 225. So this I think is important. We may slip a little bit. But I don't know that we should slip off the map. Like, I don't think, what did we finish last year? Like five of our last 20, five of our last 30? Like something like that? It felt like it. Like, I don't think that should happen to us. Now, this is a tough week, right? you got the Warriors and the Lakers at home. And we should, frankly, we sh- it'll be interesting to see. I don't want to say we should win games because nobody ever likes it when you say that. But we should win, we should win one or two of these games if, if we're still going to be able to compete. We're at home. We have a de- commanding home court advantage. And that's, you know, um, by the way, I think we we were 27 and 29 last year when we made the trade. So we finished 10 and 18. We won like two in a row, right? Or one or two in a row after trade deadline. Actually won four out of six right out of the trade deadline. Then we finished the year. The five, the, the five and whatever I'm thinking of is a six- is a six and 14 finish. I don't think that happens this year. This team doesn't look to me like a team that goes six and 14, considering how well it's been playing recently. Now, does it play 500? Maybe. Instead of playing 19 and 11? Yeah, maybe. Um, partially because I think we've outperformed our point differential a little bit. So that the 19 and 11 is a little advantageous to close games wins. And then part two is that we're, we're not quite as good. Unless, you know, unless Taylor really can step up. Ta- Taylor placing Kelly is a step backwards or else Taylor would have been playing in front of Kelly prior to that. But it's, in, as the front office said, Justin said, it's important, very, very important for the front office to see Taylor Hendricks and what he can do. And I think every jazz, a lot of jazz fans want to see that too. So that's the summary of Justin Zanuck, not binary, not trying to force an outcome. The vision's clearly three or four or five years down the road. I want to play games that matter. I want to find out what we have in the future. Believes it's different than last year. You're not just falling off the map. And lastly, the, you're making bets. And the big bet they made is that the end of first round picks better than Ocha. And the other admission they made is that Simone and Kelly were not a part of the future of where the Jazz are going. The Simone one's interesting because Simone was a good enough player that I think he could have been part of your rotation. And the only problem is if he got a bunch of money and he's 28 years old, so he's not that old. So you could, that's a bet I would say you made also. You made a bet that Simone wasn't going to be a part of your future and was going to be priced at a value in the offseason that didn't match what you wanted to pay him for his role on the future of this team. That that's that that would be the second bet. All right. Uh Jazz Warriors tonight. We'll get into it. The Warriors have have, have re-clicked in. A little bit, having won four in a row and six of seven, we'll discuss where they are as we continue here on Locked on Jazz. Today's show is brought to you by Nissan. Nissan's got three cars out there right now that you that they want to tell you about. 
Okay. Line up of three SUVs. Take your adventure to the next level. The Rogue is the perfect for city drives and great escapes. The class exclusive Google built in as always updating assistant to call on uh, for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, Google Play Store are all built into your 12.3 inch HD touchscreen information system. And it's actually your 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. Then there's the Nissan Pathfinder. Has a room up to six, an expansive cargo capacity, advanced avail availability, four by four capability, and 284 horsepower with 6,000 pounds of towing. And then there's the Armada, which will change what you expect out of a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged four by four that can seat up to eight in your first luxury class and style. Tow big and explore further in the 2024 Armada Take. The Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, the Armada, and go find your next big adventure Shop NissanUSA.com. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen for the everydayers. Thank you. You're out there. Love it. Appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by. I'll try to remember to bring my stickers into the arena tonight. So stop by and I'll hand you. I'll see if I can hand you a Locked On Jazz sticker. Um, all right. So the Warriors were written for dead. The Warriors, I feel like, Here's my take on the Warriors just in general. So I had, I, I had the Warriors projected fairly high this year. And then I look back at one thing about the Warriors last year, and I feel like there's a little bit of kind of a forgotten about what the Warriors... So last year, the Warriors were 44 and 38, which, like, is only okay. And they got to 44 and 38 by winning, like, eight of their last 10. So they put the throttle down at the very end and like got it done. And then had it, was it not for one of the single greatest performances and a De'Aaron Fox injury in a game seven in NBA history, Steph Curry scored 50 on 38 shots going 20 of 38. Clay Thompson went four of 19. Kevon Looney had 21 boards, 10 of them offensive, and De'Aaron Fox was not right at 5 of 19 that day. They lose in the first round of the playoffs to the Sacramento Kings. That, that's the truth. Sacramento struggled, certainly scored, I think, like 32 points in the second half. Maybe 42. But Steph had 50. And then they lost to a Laker team that I still don't think was very good. In six. And in a series that was moderately close, I mean, they got blasted in two of the games. But they were 44 and 38. So why is it such a freak show for everybody that the Warriors have kind of been like fuddling around? Now, they have suddenly won six of seven with a win over, I believe, the Embiid-less 76ers. No, Embiid played in that game, but I think that's a game where he was clearly hurt. Memphis. Brooklyn, Embiidless 76ers, good win over the Pacers, and a really good win over the Suns the other night. So they've clicked in. Now, they have an incredibly road-heavy schedule the rest of the way, and they've not been a great road team. So they're a little bit behind where you'd expect them to be, considering they were 44 and 38 last year. But they're also all a year older. Their starting point guard, and Chris Paul's been out for most of the season. And while he might be like mercurial is the nice word for it. The fact of the matter is that this team needs Draymond Green. And since Draymond Green has come back and moved into the starting lineup, they're six and two. And one of those is like an incredible loss to the Lakers in double overtime that they probably shouldn't have lost. And the loss to the Atlanta Hawks, if I remember correctly, they didn't play anyone. Nope, that's not right. They did play everyone. That. There was a game in there where they didn't play anyone after that Lakers game. But, so, I'm actually not as, like, stunned about the Warriors season as everyone else's. And I do think, like, there's something also that when Draymond goes and misses five games and gets suspended and then misses another million games he's suspended, he's just wearing his teammates out. They all have a bigger burden because he's not around. Now, we'll see if he can hold it together, but he matters. 
If you kind of look at games when Draymond's played this year, they beat New Orleans by t- early in the year. They beat New Orleans by 28. They beat Sac by one. They beat Oklahoma City by two. Then he's inactive. Then he gets suspended. He's old. He can't move quite the same way. He now fiddles around with stupid stuff. Um, he beats the Clippers. They beat the Clippers by six. They lose the Clippers by one. This is before the Clippers totally take off, but this is still a pretty good Clippers team. They lose to Oklahoma City by two. Then Draymond gets suspended again. Then Draymond comes back. They lose to the Lakers, the Spurs, the Kings by one, the Lakers by one, and they won the collection game. We said, like, they, they've they been really very much exactly who we thought they were last year when Draymond's been around, and then when you take away one of their most important players and suspend him for an extended period of time, they're not very good. I'm, I'm not – I'm a little mystified on why there's this, like, narrative about the Warriors. That's so, and now Jonathan Kaminga is playing out of his head, which makes them interesting. Kaminga in the last – 10 games, averaging 23.6 rebounds, three assists, 59% from the field. So now they suddenly have an Andrew Wiggins last 10 games is back. So this is a load tonight. And then Steph is awesome. And I can't wait to watch him. Um, He's really, really awesome. And I really, really can't wait to watch him. So that's kind of the truth on where the Warriors are. And I'm not sure why the narrative has been so like outlandish that, oh my gosh, the Warriors. Eh. 44 and 38, single greatest experience play by got like game seven, maybe ever in the history of the game, got them through a wrap first round of the playoffs. Otherwise, they're a first round out. And then they've been missing one of their most important key pieces, probably their second best player, for a bunch of times this year, and they're 25 and 25. Doesn't seem like totally stunning to me. Have they clicked in now? Like to what level? Yeah, they've clicked in. They're six and two since Draymond came back. Are they a championship level team? Probably not. Probably not. Is it going to take like an unbelievable first round performance by Steph Curry to get them out of the first round? Probably. That's my take. But they're rolling right now. Fun one tonight. Sirius XM for the call as well as NBA app, Utah Jazz app, Jazz and the Warriors. Thanks very much. Tomorrow we'll recap this one. Get ready for the Lakers. Follow through. We'll learn a little bit more. See what Taylor Hendricks can do. It's going to be fun to watch him each and every night and see what the other rotation spot is for the Jazz. I did not see Bryce Sensabaugh on the injured list today. So it'll be interesting to see whether the... Checking, 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 checking. Oh, I do. Questionable left hip soreness. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not if Bryce Sensabaugh gets healthy, if it's him or Taylor Horton Tucker in the uh, ninth spot of the rotation. Jazz Warriors tonight. Ron and I will talk to you then. Have a good one.